gold in the Sierra Nevada mountains drew fortune seekers from all over the world to the heart of Placer County. By the early 1850s, the gold rush was over and the area was searching for new ways to pull money out of the ground. California had a lot to offer, but moving freight was difficult, expensive, and dangerous. The obvious solution was to take advantage of the power of railroads, but was it even possible to get a train all the way over the 7,200-foot Donner Summit, or would it turn out to be a swindle on the American taxpayers? This was a question that would take years and tens of millions of dollars to answer. During the second year of the Civil War, as President Lincoln was resolved to unify the North and South, he hoped this plan would also unite the East and the West. In 1862, the Pacific Railway Act was passed, putting the full faith and more importantly funding of the American government behind the construction of a transcontinental railroad. If completed, this massive infrastructure project would change the face of transportation and commerce. With its stated companion project of a coast-to-coast -coast telegraph line, it was also about to change the speed of cross-continent communication from months to seconds. Out of the millions of small problems that plague enterprises of this size, there was just one that seemed insurmountable, the Sierra Nevada. Many believed the portion of the proposed railroad that ran through Placer County would be impossible to build. The terrain was too rough, the incline too steep, and the granite spine of the mountains impenetrable. However, according to Theodore Judah, who was an initial champion of this endeavor and surveyor of the route, there was a way. He believed the nearly uninterrupted ridge, which sits between the Bear and American rivers, was the Central Pacific's best bet for making it over the summit. In November of 1863, work in Placer County started at present-day Roseville. Construction was relatively smooth and track was laid by spring. Many of the raw materials, such as timber for railroad ties and gravel for building road beds, could be found in abundance nearby. Once the railroad passed Newcastle, the easy work was over. The Central Pacific Line ran into its first real challenge, carving out Bloomer Cut. In June, workers began the dangerous and exhausting job of cutting a wedge through a high mound at Bloomer Divide. The peak of this hill is 62 feet high and composed of a mixture of compacted clay and gravel that acted like concrete. This challenge required drilling holes and then dangerously blasting with black powder. Due to the cramped quarters, there was not enough room to overcome the work with large numbers of workers. Hampered by delays and a lack of funding, an estimated 40 to 60 workers toiled on and off for almost a year to blast just 800 feet through the mound until finally lay in the rail in early May of 1865. When it was finished, the cut was hailed as the eighth wonder of the world. Even so, it was far from the most difficult problem encountered as a track wound its way toward Donner Summit. Because of the Civil War raging back east, laborers were in short supply. Charles Crocker suggested hiring Chinese to build the line over the Sierra Nevada. Despite initial reservations, eventually more than 12,000 Chinese were employed. In order to maintain Judas engineering standards as the line progressed, some mountain ravines had to be spanned by way of wooden trestles. The two largest were the long ravine trestle that was 878 feet long and 120 feet high, and the secret town trestle which was 1,100 feet long and 90 feet high. These remarkable structures required immense quantities of lumber which would rot over time and could also catch fire from steam engine sparks. To solve these problems, the areas under the trestle were filled in with dirt and rocks brought in by the cartload. This built up the enormous berm the railroad sits on today. After making its way through the town of Colfax and beyond Long Ravine, the work grew increasingly difficult. With all the clear cutting and granite blasting, the cost of grading rose to over $100,000 per mile. 
the granite of the Sierra Nevada began to show itself in all its near impervious glory at the spur known as Cape Horn, which loomed 2,200 feet above the waters of the American River below. Passing around this outcropping required cutting a ledge around the outside edge of this cliff face on which to run the tracks. The rock was chipped and blasted day by day from September of 1865 until the winter set in. Astonishing everyone involved, the blasting work was done before the snowy weather forced a retreat down the mountain until spring. By May of 1866, the track was laid around Cape Horn and another impossible feat had been accomplished. Railroad travelers today can still look out their windows as they pass by Cape Horn and get a sense of the sheer fortitude required to carve this ledge. The biggest miscalculation made by Judah was that trains could overcome the huge amount of snow on the summit. Even armed with the latest snowplow technology, a giant iron wedge mounted to the front of a series of locomotives, steam power was no match for a hard winter where snow drifts as high as 30 feet could bury the tracks. From 1866 to 1868, the crews camped at Cisco while they constructed a massive shed system to shelter the tracks between tunnels. These sheds needed to be sturdy enough to withstand heavy snowfall as well as the destructive forces of avalanches. Once built, these flammable wooden structures were immediately tested by sparks thrown off from the passing trains, failing numerous times which ended with miles of sheds in ashes. Over 37 miles of snowsheds at a cost of over $2 million have been built up the western and down the eastern slopes of the Sierra Nevada. Portions of this system continue to protect rail traffic lumbering across the summit 150 years later and can still be seen by travelers driving along Interstate 80. As a line continued to steam through the Sierra, it was critical to avoid creating sharp curves. At lower elevations, maintaining this engineering standard was a hassle, but once work progressed into the formidable granite of the Sierras, it became a colossal problem. At 1,659 feet long, the summit tunnel was the single biggest obstacle on the entire railroad line. While this monumental task would be difficult enough in good weather, Six months of the year, the summit of the Sierra was prone to snow on the ground. Add to that the fact that this was a race to Utah and the average tunnel depth carved per day was around six inches. When digging the tunnel from both ends wasn't fast enough, a decision was made to sink a 70-foot shaft where the middle of the tunnel would be so workers could blast back in both directions and effectively double the speed of the project. That combined with working around the clock brought the time it took to build the tunnel down to less than two years. Once the tracks reached the state line and left the scenic and rugged environs of Placer County, the speed of track lane increased from an average of 30 miles per year to the relatively breakneck pace that set the countrywide record of 10 miles of track laid in a single day. Far from being a swindle, the railroad brought new prosperity to California by lowering the cost of goods flowing into and out of the state and tying the West to the rest of the country.